Um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our session, our career conversation today. I'm really happy that you are able to spend this hour with us. Before I introduce our guests, our panelists, um, please make sure that your mic is on mute. Um, also make sure that your camera is switched off um, so that we don't have any distractions and then you will have an opportunity to ask questions. So please feel free to type any questions in the meeting chat. Um, I've just realized I haven't introduced myself. <laughs> My name is, is Megan. I'm one of the careers advisors at Career Service. I also have Azola, who is going to be assisting me with collating your questions today. Um, the session is recorded um, so that um, other students can watch it afterwards. So without further ado, if I can ask our panelists to please switch on their cameras um, so that I can introduce you. Um, I'm just waiting for Sharif to switch on his camera. Fantastic, thank you so much. So um, I'd like to warmly welcome um, Colonel uh, Lachey Rousseau, um, who is a section commander for the Specialized Identification Services um, at the Victim Identification Center um, for the Forensic Science Laboratory, and that's for the South African Police Services. And then I would also like to warmly welcome Megan Peterson, and she's a senior scientific officer at the Division of Clinical Anatomy and Biological Anthropology at UCT. And then last but not least, um, Dr. Sharif Hendricks, who is a senior lecturer at the Division of Exercise Science and Sports Medicine, as well as a visiting fellow at Leeds Beckett University based in the United Kingdom. So thank you so much for availing um, yourselves today. Um, I'm really looking forward to engaging with you. So let's get started with our questions. So I'm going to, to ask you each to give a brief account um, of your career journey. So just a little bit about your tertiary education, your first job, your subsequent jo job, and your current job. So if we can start with Megan, um, if you can unmute your mic. Thanks. Okay, hi everybody. Um, so my <laughs> my tertiary career journey um, started back in 2010 when um, I, obviously I was in grade 12 at the time and I wanted to apply to study medicine. Um, obviously, um, those applications were then met with rejection letters um, and that then prompted me to go um, into a different route and study a um, BSc in medical biosciences at the University of the Western Cape. Um, and the reason I chose to do that particular degree is because there was this ad that I heard at the time. And um, to those of you who watch a lot of um, crime scene television drama, we you know. Um, there was a series at the time and they said, you know, oh, do you want to be the next Horatio Kane? And Horatio Kane was the lead actor for CSI Miami. <laughs> and I was like, that's me. That's what I want to do. And um, so, yes, that afforded me the opportunity to then um, do medical biosciences. And I then majored in anatomy, physiology and medical microbiology. Um, I then graduated that degree, um, but I wasn't sure of where to find employment. So I then opted to do my honours, and when I finished my honours, I still couldn't find permanent employment. So I then went and did a master's. Um, but the thing about my journey is that during that time, um, I joined up with a work study program at um, the university that I was at. And so that's when I started tutoring anatomy and physiology in, in practicals. And later on, I was like, you know, I want something more. Um, so I started volunteering um, to do my supervisor's lectures. And um, by word of mouth, people sort of just started hearing about me. And that's how I actually landed up um, various part-time lecturing 
um, position. So first I was at UWC and um, then I moved on to Cape Peninsula University of Technology. Thank you so much um, for sharing that um, with us, Megan. Um, sounds really interesting and we'll obviously come back to the nitty gritty details a, a bit yes. later. So if I can maybe move to, to you, Sharif, um, um, to tell us a little bit. Oh, well, he looks paused, so maybe I'll give him a chance. Um, I'll maybe move to Lachey and then I'll come back to you, Sharif. So if you can share with us your, your career journey, Lachey. Thanks so much, Megan. <coughs> come again to everyone. Um, thank you for having me this afternoon. So yes, I, I have a similar similar um, starting point to what Megan shared with us a minute ago. Um, just mind the subtract 10 years, 10 years yeah, prior to her joining um, UWC. But yes, I started at UWC. Um, I also did the BSc in Medical Bioscience. And like Megan, um, maybe not Horatio so much because he wasn't around in my time, <laughs> but medical detectives and rescue 911 and top cops for those who know those, those years. Um, I've always I've always wanted to do forensic science, and when I started my tertiary journey, there was no straight route. There was no mm -hmm. undergrad that afforded that opportunity. So I did the medical bioscience, um, like like Megan, specializing in anatomy, physiology, made micro, um, and then in my honors year, I stayed at UWC, but I moved over to the Department of Biotechnology. Um, at that time, they were running a forensic laboratory. Um, Prof. Sean Davison, for those who are familiar with him. Um, I joined his lab, and that was my first sort of introduction to actual forensic work, um, doing DNA extraction from buccal swabs and um, teeth, and yeah, it was quite quite interesting. And then while I was in doing my honours um, at UWC, we had a collaboration with UCT, um, the Physical Anthropology Department of Anatomy, um, who sort of shared a course that we, that we offered jointly. And that was when I was introduced to forensic anthropology. And this is pre-Bones, everybody. Before Bones was Bones. And um, Temperance Brennan was a name we all knew. Um, and then I got interested in forensic anthropology, because at the time in our laboratory, we were extracting DNA from bone, bone samples. And I was like, hey, wait a minute. I want to do the digging of the bone, as well as the extraction wow. of the DNA. So I met with the supervisor at UCT, Professor Alan Morris, who subsequently retired. and. Um, I was very interested, but in the meantime, life happened. And between my honors year, I um, joined SANBI, for those who are familiar, the African National Biodiversity Institute based in Kirstenbosch Gardens. I spent a day working in the molecular laboratory, very different to forensics, um, no bearing on what I was studying, but an opportunity to apply, obviously, the science um, education that I had to a laboratory, and I was appointed as a laboratory manager. So that was it was a great experience, fantastic experience. And I planned to stay there, do my master's through them. But I soon realized that forensics was always a passion of mine. And as much as I enjoyed working, systematic biology, the phy phylogenetic trees and bootstrap bootstrap <laughs> and physiology. And um, so then I, I resigned from Zambi and I contacted uh, Professor Morris at UCT. Um, human, the human biology department at Med Campus, for those who are familiar, the pink building. And um, I said, Alan, look, I'm interested in doing a master's degree in forensic anthropology. I don't have a background in anthropology, but I'm willing to learn. Mm -hmm. And Alan, Alan was um, willing to take, take a risk and he allowed me to, to join. So I resigned and I went back to full time studying at UCT. Um, and so I did a master's there. I won't tell you how long I took, but it was too much fun. Um, and after my master's, I joined, well, I worked part-time for the National Prosecuting Authority. They have a national MPA. They have a task team called the Missing Persons Task Team. And the mandate of the team is to exhume the remains of South African anti-apartheid activists who were sort of disappeared or killed during our struggle. Um, and so I worked there for you know, on, on, an, on a contract basis, which is fantastic, applying what I was learning in my master's in actual day-to-day -day, um, experiences. And then in, in that, I also had an opportunity to go to um, New York. I was a visiting scientist at the Forensic Biology Laboratory for the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner for the City of New York. I think sure. Sure. So that was fun. And then fast forward um, a couple of years, or well, the same year I met my current, my current boss, the police came to our laboratory for a conference and she's like what are you doing in New York how me how why 
And um, when I got back from New York, I applied to the forensic division of the SAPS, and that's what I did. So, yeah, wish me luck. <laughs> wow, Lachey, um, what a what a journey. Um, sure, it, it, both of you, it sounds really interesting. So, um, Sharif, I, I read that you're having a little bit of a delay in your network. Um, so let's see how it goes. If you feel it's better with your camera off, then please feel free to do that. Um, so please go ahead and share your, your career journey with us. Cool. Can, can you guys hear me? So is everything fine now? Yeah. Yes, so it seems yes. like all three of us have our origins at UWC <laughs> Medical Biosciences. Um, so I did a BSc um, Sports and Exercise Science at UWC, and obviously with the BSc Sports, I a major biomedical. Uh, did you get that? Are you? Are they, I I think um, let's try um, with your with your your camera off. We we lost some yeah. of the words. Yeah. Um, so BSc Sports and Exercise Science um, with a part of it in the med medical biosciences and then because of the medical biosciences um, got interested in physiology, um, pure physiology and then applied for um, physiology honours at UCT, got into UCT physiology um, during that year found out maybe I don't want to do um, pure physiology because um, the honours project was um, in the lab working with the rats um, when I found out about um, another division within the Department of Human Biology which is the Division of Exercise Science and Sports Medicine where they had a bit more applied physiology um, and then finished my master's and PhD um, within that division in 2012. Did a postdoc um, for three years um, in the same department and then um, in 2016 went overseas um, for a year to the UK and then came back in 2017, did a senior research office position and then currently in the senior lecture position at UCT. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so my next question to all of you is kind of share with us um, the details of your day to day job. Um, so maybe um, if I start with you, Sharif, um, I know that you have your fingers in many pies um, and you're involved in lots of activities that are quite exciting. So maybe if you can share um, that with us, please. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so, um, so it changes day to day, but generally it will be trying it will be trying to work on a paper or a publication that needs to go in. Um, usually it will and then like midway in the morning it will maybe meet up with a student um, or two and then yeah like later in the afternoon also just um, then get some admin or emails done um, and then again uh, mainly help out a student or two. Um, I know there's some third years um, physiology students maybe in the um, in the audience this morning or this afternoon. Um, May was a big um, teaching load as well. So um, so I had a lot of um, lectures for undergraduate and then also every Tuesday for two hours I sat down with the honor students as well um, and chatted to them about um, performance and training. Yeah. Um, do you want to maybe share um, some insight into the, the, um, the website that you've created um, for those of um, students that might be interested? Can I ask you which one is <laughs> Whichever one you think would be, um, I don't know, interesting to everyone. Okay, yeah, I think so the, yeah. the rugby related one. <laughs> okay, so the, yeah, so there's two there's two websites that um, we manage. Oh. It's kind of related to the area where we, found, we we thought we need to communicate our research better, and then we created this website called rugbyscientist.com, and you can find out about our research on there. And last year, if you're thinking of applying for honours, we also created a website for the honours at med school called Health Sciences Reviews. And so if you're doing an honours next year with, um, with us in any field of within health sciences, um, you will be part of your assignments will be to translate a research paper and then we publish it on this website. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so, Megan, um, if you can share with us your, um, you know, exactly what your job entails. OK, so um, I started working at UCT in 2019, um, in May of 2019. Um, I was employed as a senior scientific officer in anatomy. Um, so my day-to-day -day role um, basically entails preparation of resources for the anatomy practi um, practicals across various um, divisions or departments because we do service um, various departments um, within health sciences and then also sciences. Um, I'm also involved in um, the practical setup. So I would set up for the practicals physically, making sure that, that um, the cadavers or specimens um, are laid out, that they're pinned, labeled, um, getting the anatomy models ready. Um, yeah, and then also I, I facilitate some practical talks for the students, so pre-practical talks. Um, I do demonstrations as well. Um, I actually, I have a third year medic demonstration that I need to um, attend to at two okay. today. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and then there's also the second year medics who do dissections. Um, those are usually in the mornings and they run from Mondays to Thursdays. Um, yeah, and then I, I mainly like, I oversee the health and rehab courses year one and year two. So, um, yeah, I, I would basically be responsible for everything pertaining to the practicals. Um, and then I also, I have total oversight over the plastination unit um, within CABA. Um, so, yes, <laughs> I have to manage a lab as well. Wow, <laughs> it sounds it sounds extremely busy on your side, Megan. Um, thank you for that. And then um, lastly, Lachey, if you can share with us, um, you know, about what your job entails. Thanks. <clears throat> it's not as exciting as both Sharif and Megan. Um, my job entails sitting in meetings most days. Um, so yes, I, I have, like like was said at the beginning, I work with the, I work with the police um, in the forensic division. So I guess I got the forensic scientist job after all. Without, with all the paperwork and all the emails. Um, so the section, the unit that I sort of um, manage, specialized identification services, um, that falls within the section victim identification. So our unit is um, solely responsible for the identification of victims, um, be it from natural disasters, from mass, mass disasters in South Africa, a mass disaster um, is defined as a taxi accident. You know, um, we have those quite often and any, any, Incident that has more than two victims is considered a mass disaster. Um, mass fatality. Um, yeah, so our, our our role in the in the forensic services division is to identify unidentified bodies, um, mm. both from accidents and also just bodies that end up in the mortuary system mm. uh, of the country. So my specific unit, um, the reason why it's called specialized identification, is that we well I manage forensic anthropology, which is fantastic because it's what I studied. I manage forensic entomology. So for those who are familiar, it's the study of entomological exhibits or, or insects on a, on a corpse um, to determine the time since death or the time since infestation um, that, the, that wow. the, have a chance to in, in, infest the, the corpse. Um, we have a forensic entomologist in our section and I manage her um, as well as facial reconstruction, which is a fantastic field, which is not many people know about. Um, we currently have three employed forensic artists. I will say artists because all three gentlemen are artistic first and foremost. Um, and then they have obviously honed the artistic skill um, to sort of focus on the, on the face, the human face, um, knowing the skull very well, the muscles of the face, the attachment sites, the insertion sites of the muscles. So they basically can take a skull and with a particular set of set of data, reconstruct wow. the skull um, to put a face on it. So we have Facial reconstruction as part of the um, forensic arsenal that the police mm. can. So that's what I manage day to day. That's the little unit that I'm I'm in charge of. 
Wow, that, that sounds really interesting. And I think I've learned so much just listening to all three of you. Um, so thanks for sharing um, with us. Um, so if, we, if we're thinking about skills, so obviously you have your discipline specific skills um, that you were taught with regards to your education. And then um, the more kind of softer skills, the, the transferable skills that we would usually refer it refer to in our um, conversations with students, um, perhaps share with us um, yeah, what you what is that core set of skills that you would be utilizing on a day to day basis? Um, so perhaps Megan, if you would like to go first this time. Um, OK, so just in terms of this core, uh, in the core skills pertaining to my job, uh, well, firstly, you need to have a very good basis of anatomy. Um, so, yes, that's that's very, very important. Um, and then also cadaver handling. Cadaver handling is very important because obviously it is so precious and we need to be um, respectful um, toward the cadavers because um, a lot of the cadavers that we do have, these are obviously, they were individuals who have decided to donate their bodies to science to aid students in the teaching experience or the learning experience, if I can put it that way. Um, dissections, dissections is all for one of the skills that um, I was fortunate enough to, to learn while I was studying. Um, and then just in terms of the, the softer type of skills, you know, you need to be able to have um, very good um, written and verbal um, communication um, mm. skills and then you need to be good at public speaking because very often um, like in my case you know having to address students within a lab setting um, and then you need to be detail oriented and what well, gosh <laughs> there's just <laughs> so many things that I can think of um, you know, time management is also one of yeah. the things. Yeah. And that's that's very important, especially when you have to oversee so many courses, um, making sure that deadlines are met, et cetera, et cetera. So, yes. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned time management skills and communication skills. And I think um, just to draw a student's attention to the fact that um, those are skills that can be developed um, kind of outside of the academic environment as well um, by taking up the extramural activity. So we will always encourage um, students to, to kind of become involved, not at the expense of the academic program, but it's also to develop um, the other sets of skills that, that really is um, helpful in the work environment. So perhaps, um, Sharif, if I can ask you, um, you can build on what, what Megan said with regards to your, your, your set of skills that you use daily. Yeah, so 100% I can build on from Megan because the core skills, um, being a scientist, is communication skills essentially, um, especially writing, and then obviously also public speaking and then communi communicating your science. Um, but a, a skill that we kind of try to um, teach our um, students also is how to kind of be self-aware and, and, and interpret data um, being aware of your biases um, and and also how to, I know it sounds um, simple, but like reading between the lines um, when you're looking at data, when you're looking at information. Um, yeah, and essentially having that conversation with yourself and building that dialogue within yourself in terms of when you look at data, and this is just not for every, this is not just within the scientific domain, like in, in, in life as well. Um, mm -hmm. So those are skills that, that, that kind of you need to build on. Um, yeah, absolutely. That makes so much sense. Um, Lachey, if you can build on on um, on that as well, please. Um, fantastic. So what I've found in my job <laughs> that I work in, um, like I mentioned, I, I'm, I'm thrust into sort of a management um, role. And um, so very quickly, I had to sort of learn managerial skills and leadership skills, um, having been a scientist myself. Um, I will say I wasn't maybe as equipped as I would have liked to have been um, when I first started within the police. Um, but the, the other responsibilities in my in my day to day and in, in my skill set is sort of you know administration, 
managing people. Um, that includes you know, sort of random things to take for granted, but like the HR issues, um, leave and um, people's, you know, job, um, the, the performance plans and evaluations. And at, at the end of the day, you get bogged down with all the admin work that the actual sort of skill set that you initially came into the job with um, gets gets pushed to the side of it. So yeah, so I find myself more in that sort of um, space, um, policy writing, you know, writing, writing documents, quality documents for our SOPs, our policies, our forms that we make use of in our day-to-day -day, um, operational um, work. Um, and then the very important in my environment, especially having to um, gain the police culture and ethos. And you know, I say flippantly, but mm -hmm. let me tell you, <laughs> It is a whole nother ball game. Sure. Having, you know, been in academia up until the master's level, um, having you know, my, my limited exposure outside, joining the the, um, the police has been a, an eye opener. It's been a, a learning sure. um, So Yes, having to sort of come with my scientific, you know, inquiring, um, verbalizing my thoughts, um, coming with that sort of set of skills mm. or of inculcation, mm. and then thrust into an environment where it's comply and complain later, you know, follow instruction, um, don't question the instructions. So it's been a it's been an interesting journey. Um, but yes, it was definitely part of having to learn the police culture. Wow, um, that is that is so interesting to hear. Um, thank you, thank you for that. Um, so we, we're nearing our, our questions. If I can encourage you students to please um, put all of it in the chat um, so that we can um, come back to it. Um, but if you kind of look back, um, what do you wish you had known as a student? So um, Lachey, because you're still on our screen, perhaps if you can go first. What um, would you so have liked to have known? Um, so for myself, um, I think people management skills. Um, I, I always joke, it's a running joke that I have with my colleagues and my friends, that the reason why I chose to work with the dead is because I can't work with the living. Um, <laughs> no, I say that flippantly, but there's a little bit of truth, just a little bit of truth. Um, so yes, for me, you know, in, this, in the student environment, you're very, I don't want to say isolated, but especially in the post-grad post -grad world, you have your project, you have your supervisor, your co-supervisor, and it's really just about, you know, that sort of um, journey and that and, and, and sort of managing that that, that um, dynamic way as in, in, in I don't want to say in the, in the big wide world, but, you know, out there in organizations, be it parastatal, be it government, be it private sector, be it corporate, you know, you have to work with people. The, the, the whole teamwork issue becomes a big part of your day to day. So for myself, um, have I, having had maybe some sort of full knowledge of people management skills would have definitely gone a long way um, just to prepare me for what I, for what I encountered. Um, mm. So, yeah, and again, you know, I wasn't really, in my, in, my, in my case, I wasn't really aware that I had an option to um, enter a career, so to speak, um, in forensic anthropology. I was very content with the fact that I would stay in academia, you know, just continue, to continue the academic stream. Um, and yeah, so, you know, being aware of these things while you're a student is very important. I had no idea. When I was doing my master's, I had no idea I'd end up where I, where I am. So it's pretty yeah. hard. Yeah. Expose yourself to different environments and different options, and you never know where you'll end up. And I think uh, maybe just to to touch on what you said, it's also then you were having to learn on the job um, these people management skills that um, you lacked, and obviously as you practice that, you will get better and better at that particular skill. Um, so yeah, thank you, um, Megan. Are you still there? Um, so perhaps if you can um, uh -huh. kind of share. Uh, what you would have no, liked um, to yes, have known I am here. Okay, um, so, you know, one of the, the things that I wish I'd known um, back when I started studying was um, that there is a difference between professional degrees and formative or your so-called academic degrees. Um, because I, I didn't, you know, all I knew was that I wanted to study and I wanted to be in health sciences. And because I couldn't get into that, I then hopped on to the next best thing. Um, and so if there are students that maybe don't know the difference, and so 
regarding a professional degree, you know, those are the type of degrees that tend to equip you with a clear defined set of skills within a specific um, area of specialization. Um, and those degrees, they often come with compulsory internships or work placements that form part of those curriculums. Whereas your academic degrees, while they encourage critical thinking, they, um, they often have a theoretical approach to the subjects. I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, there aren't practicals involved, there are, but a large body of a large component of the work would be the theory based. Um, or at least that's what it, that's how it was in my case. Um, and with your academic degrees, you don't always see a clear career path. Um, but those degrees, they tend to help you broaden your skill set. And that can then often be applied across various disciplines. Um, so just to, like, if, if I have to think back to people that studied with me, um, I know people who completed the undergrad in medical biosciences, and then they went on to become medical un underwriters at um, insurance companies. Um, some of them are even working at SEPs as warrant officers. Um, mm. Uh, yes, so Lasha, you would know. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I have friends who've become teachers, they've become laboratory technicians, um, and some have even become funeral undertakers. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, the world is your oyster. Sure. Um, wow, I, I'm so glad that you've that you've touched on on that point, um, Megan, because um, just to tell students that um, this is why we have careers services um, to actually support you to be able to identify um, what it is that you have to offer and what those opportunities are that are out there. And it might be different depending on what it is that you want for yourself. Um, and we always say to students that, um, do you know, it's, it's, it's how you present yourself, whether it be um, in an application, in an interview, um, so that you can be noticed. So please feel free, um, you know, if you are undecided about where you see yourself um, beyond your degree, please book an appointment with us. Um, we do one on one consultations um, we also do career development webinars and we do um, finding work series. So check out the website. Um, it's always um, kind of there for you. Um, yeah, so I'm really happy that you've mentioned that. Um, so last but not like not not least, um, Sharif, if you can share with us um, you know, what you would have liked to have known as a student. Um, thanks, Megan. Um, yeah, like I actually don't know how to answer this one kind of looking back. I won't mm -hmm. lie when I was an undergrad and even honors, I was focused a lot on um, my sport at the time, um, so yeah, um, so, so 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 sport took a priority. So if I had to kind of look back, I'd probably say probably should have focused more on your studies. Um, <laughs> some, um, and and in that respect, kind of like in undergrad, like what I know a bit now more about memory is kind of to avoid the. Did everything build up until exam type of scenario and then kind of just crunch time it's actually important to recall what you know um so 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 kind of that from an undergrad um, point of view in terms of studying for exams and then in honors year yeah um just keep an open mind read a lot um write a lot as well mm -hmm. sometimes honors student um honors is mainly to build you as a scientist now and we, like because it's only a year and it's such a like full year, um, you forget that you actually need to to write um, as well. So in honors, yeah, read and write, and then I think after that, masters, PhD, you'll kind of um, get the idea. Yeah. Mm, thank thank you for that that wisdom. <laughs> um, I think I'll keep the the last question um, kind of towards the end. Um, perhaps if I can ask Azola to send through some of the questions that have come through. Um, and then we can kind of jump in there. 
OK, so the first question that I have, I'm going to to read it. This is for you, Lachey. Um, how has forensic anthropology grown over the last few years? Because um, I know it is quite a new sector in South Africa and there are not many forensic anthropology posts currently, besides if you are in academia and that's a question mark. I am doing my honours in biological anthropology at UCT and I'm looking to do my masters in forensic anthropology next year. So thanks, 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 Chesley, for that for that question. So yes, um, anthropology is still fairly fairly new um, in, in the South Africa. Um, what I can say is that the police are um, growing the field. Currently, we only have anthropologists or forensic anthropologists based in Pretoria at our head office, um, as well as in Cape Town at the Plattercliffe Laboratory. For those who are familiar yeah. with the South African Police Laboratory in Plattercliffe, um, we currently have two anthropologists stationed there. Um, can I guarantee that the posts will, or the, the, the environment will grow um, next year or tomorrow? No, I can't. But there's definitely um, scope within the police um, to join. Besides the police, I don't know any other environment that, uh, that employs forensic anthropologists besides academia, like you correctly mm -hmm. said. And like I said as well, my, my goal or my aim was stay in academia, do a PhD, you know, become a lecturer um, and just do research in the field. So that is an option as well, not a bad option. Um, but yes, the master's fantastic. I would support that completely. Um, I did my master's in forensic anthro at UCT. And then you never know where it'll lead to. But do keep on looking. So the police, we post all our vacancies in the local newspapers. Um, in Cape Town, I think it's the Sunday Times and the Argus. Um, keep on checking those posts and maybe I can get your details and I've always forward you something that comes up um, when it does. But yeah, it is a new field, but we are growing in the police. Currently, we have six employed anthropologists plus myself make seven, which is not bad. Wow. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, our next question is, um, oh, so it actually is if the panelists would not mind sharing the email addresses for networking and getting in contact with them later on. And that's only if you feel that you can, um, then you can please put that in the, um, the meeting chat. Um, and then the next question is, what does staying in academia entail with regards to anatomy and anthropology, physiology? Um, I almost think you touched on that, um, Lachey. Does anyone else, uh, maybe a Sharif, if you want to answer that question? Um, yeah, so, so I can answer this, like specifically to physiology. Um, so obviously you will apply for an honours um, in, in, in exercise science, um, in physiology, in cell biology, in any of these like physiological sciences um, type <laughs> degrees. You'll, and honors is basically then to train you as a, as a scientist, um, and then you'll get a project that will expose you to a research project. And then beyond that, um, you kind of will do the masters and um, PhD. Again, then you've kind of changed from like what we kind of just studying in undergrad to actually doing research and writing. And then um, masters, PhD, and then post all of that, um, you eventually then, um, need to just, yeah, you continue on doing research and the research project or the field that you work in, it can be an interest of yours. It can be kind of a merger of your interest and a, a field that's already running within the, within the division or within the research group. And so, yeah, that, that's essentially what it will entail when you stay within um, the sciences and in this case, specifically anatomy and physiology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for that, Sharif. Um, just to just to make a point, I mean, you mentioned about your um, your sporting activities that that kind of um, kind of was more of a focus <laughs> for you. And um, it's interesting to note that sometimes your interests can also shape, um, you know, that that career trajectory that you embark on. Um, so I think we mustn't uh, forget that because that can can definitely play a role. Um, I, according to Azula, there are no other questions. I'm really surprised. <laughs> um, so I see Rile Bohile has asked a question. What options are available if I decide to go to the applied anatomy route and if I do not plan on continuing in academia? Is it intrinsically linked to bi biological anthropology? Mm, I'm not sure who wants to have a go to answer that. 
Okay, I, I, I think that um, that one would probably be directed at me. <laughs> um, so let me just get this straight. So the student wants to go into the applied anatomy route, um, but they don't necessarily want to stay in academia. Um, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, well, you know, with with my with my role, so to speak, this is one of the arguments that I have with my with myself a lot, and um, with some other individuals as well. Um, I wouldn't really consider the role that I play um, at the institution as being one that um, forms part of academia, because I'm not considered as being academic staff. I fall under past staff. Um, and those are the type of staff members that would assist the academics. So that could potentially be a route where, um, you know, you could look for posts that are based in the lab where you would um, maybe prepare specimens. So you can do pro sections or dissections. Um, and then like one of the the newer techniques, um, and, and this is one of the techniques that I am involved in, this is the lab that I currently manage, which is the plastination unit. So plastination is um, a new technique that it's probably like what about 30 or 40 years old. And so it is still considered very new because um, it's trying to move away from the what is considered the normal way of preserving um, bodies, which is normally with your um, formalin solution. Um, so what we use is we use a, a technique that it removes the bodily fluid and the fat, and it replaces it with a plastic resin, which then allows for the specimen to um, be dry and um, hardened, which means that you can now, you don't need to take the specimen into a laboratory setting, you can take it into a classroom sp class setting and you can have it for the students to view um, without having all the, you know, the whole, um, the dissection kits and everything. So it makes for a cool new learning experience. Um, and then also, um, I, gosh, I don't know. There's just so many things that I can think of. Um, like even building perceptive um, models for anatomy. There's a lot of these companies that are doing these things and that, that um, then sell these models to institutions. So if you are good with your hands or you are autistic, then, then that might be a, a, a different way of getting involved in, in anatomy. Hmm. Thank, thank you for that, Megan. I'm, I'm just thinking um, on something that Lachey mentioned at the very beginning about the, the artists that kind of recreate the, um, the, the facial recognition parts that you mentioned, um, would, would that be something that um, would be where you could apply that knowledge or not necessarily? You, you're still on mute, Lachey. Just to... Apologies, you're asking me. <laughs> My apologies. Yes, sorry, sorry. Apologies. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm going to try and maybe answer both questions. I see Georgia also has a question regarding what exactly does a forensic anthropologist or, yeah, entail. Um, so to answer your question, Megan, um, facial reconstruction. So maybe I didn't, yeah, let me just break it down a bit. So what the artists are able to do is they are able to take a skull, a human skull that's been cleaned. We call it maceration, where we boil the flesh, literally boil the flesh off, off the bones. And I think uh, Megan will know this as well, because it's part of the, uh, the anatomy laboratory at all medical schools. They have a maceration facility. Um, UCT had one as well in the basement. Um, so the artists are then able to scan the skull in 3D using a 3D scanner and then plot what we call bio, um, biographical markers, bio, you know, markers on the face that have tissue depth markers. Literally, you know, African girls between this age will have this link, this sort of 
um, estimation of tissue depth. And then using software online, they were able to place muscles onto the skull um, to the depth of the tissue markers and reconstruct the face. So that technique is basically, you need to know, you need to know the muscles of the face, you need to know the facial features, the biographical markers, and then also we have the ability to be artistic so that you can actually, you know, import. Because again, very, very important forensic or facial reconstruction is not an exact science. It is more a recognition tool. So it allows the skull to be recognizable and that is used to create, you know, awareness, create dialogue, and then based on community or um, recognition, we then will take a bi biological marker like DNA or fingerprints or dental records and confirm identity. So it's not, it's not an identification tool, mm. it's just more of a recognition tool yeah. that helps us sort of narrow down the search. So that's forensic, I mean, that's facial, um, facial reconstruction. Um, the question regarding forensic anthropology, if I may, Megan. Yes, please. So, so basically a forensic anthropologist, very really similar to a biological anthropologist or a biological archaeologist even, um, specialized in the study of human bones, the skeleton, right? The human skeleton. And we are able to analyze the skeleton and determine or, est or estimate the biological profile. Biological profile means the sex of the individual, male or female, the age at time of death, the ancestry or the, uh, the ancestral affinity. So in Africa, we call it race, but that word is a bit contentious. And as well as well as any trauma to the skeleton. So we can tell ballistic trauma, blind force trauma, explosive trauma, sharp force trauma to a skeleton um, and any pathologies that are visible on the bone, mm. such as you get sort of um, thoracic tuberculosis that is present on the ribs and the, the, the thoracic vertebra. You can see. Um, so that's basically what we are able to take a skeleton, analyze it, and determine a biological profile. But added to that, we also are trained in archaeological exhumation. So you can take an anthropologist to the field, give him a give him a burial site or a grave, and they'll be able to exhume a full skeleton using archaeological techniques, which means slow, you know, meticulous, methodical, um, and obviously trying to keep all the evidence in situ and intact. So that's basically what, what anthropologists do, how we help in this country. Anthropologists assist pathologists, forensic pathologists at mortuaries, mortuaries all over the country to, um, to analyze skeletal remains. So not, not every body that comes into the mortuary system is uh, fleshed. Yeah. So we can assist the pathologists in, in the analysis of the postmortems. We can also assist archaeologists with archaeological impact assessments if they come across burial sites on a particular piece of land. Um, as well as human rights, mm -hmm. trust, so mass graves and all the rest of them. Anthropologists are, are, are useful in those settings. Fantastic. Yeah, Th thank you. Thank you for, for answering that question. Um, so I don't see any other questions coming through. So maybe from my side to ask my last question, um, perhaps any wise words <laughs> that you'd like to share with our students um, regarding them entering the field um, where they would possibly be using the anatomy and physiology um, discipline or yeah. If I, the shape, perhaps if, if you want to to continue. Thank you. I think my wisest words are enjoy being a student. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Take home message. Um, besides that, you know, again, I think Megan put it so succinctly when she was explaining the difference between a professional degree and an academic degree. And we all find ourselves in a in sort of an academic field or environment where we aren't going to come out of this four year or three year experience and then you know get an internship or a service ship or you know a placement and 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 enter the world of of work but that doesn't mean opportunities don't exist and I, I think the most important thing um for myself looking back on my experience is putting myself out there you know um not being averse to attending workshops attending conferences yes these things sometimes re require um, you know funding um but when you can Avail yourself, avail yourself in the department, you know, make yourself known to your lecturers. Um, let, let them know you by name um, and, and get involved. I think I'm not sure who mentioned it, but assist. I think yeah. maybe mentioned it, assist, you know, offer, mm -hmm. offer volunteer to, to take your, your lecturers classes or tutorials or um, I think that's just important to get into the habit 
of going beyond, above and beyond a little bit. Um, and it's amazing how those small actions um, can have great impact. Um, but yes, most importantly, enjoy being a student. Some of us are working and studying because we enjoy being a student <laughs> so much. Thank you so much for that, Lachey. Um, can I perhaps ask Sharif for your wise words to our students, please? Um, thanks, Megan. Um, look, I'm, I'm going to be super biased here now. Um, <laughs> and, but I'm, I'm always going to be um, biased in a sense and encourage and strongly encourage um, students, especially I'm assuming if you're attending this talk, you, you are you are in an anatomy or physiology undergrad program or honors program that you pursue a, a, a um, career in um, science um, and that you try as best as you can to complete um, your honors, masters and PhD and that you become the expert in your field because that's what we need as South Africa, that's what we need, yeah, essentially as, as South Africans at this moment, we need experts and you are in a position at this moment to become an expert, and that's the reality of it. I spoke to the third years last week about a degree or a, a career in or in honors in, in exercise science, and we did a kind of calculation. In the ideal world, you in 2028, you'd have a PhD, and probably you can add seven years or eight years to that. By 20, 2035, you could be a an emerging expert within your field, and that field you can decide. Um, most of the like, large discoveries or main discoveries is when the person actually created the field themselves. It's not in an existing field at this moment, but they created a field themselves. So the point being, last words, like become the expert in your field. Sure, that is, that is so inspiring. Um, thank you, uh, Sharif. Um, Megan, your last words, please. Um, yeah, so to the students, I would say, um, since they are still obviously studying, I would say consider um, entering a work study program um, and actively seek um, opportunities. And if you can't find them, then create them. Um, but importantly, um, grow your skills and knowledge and um, build on that networking skills. Um, but most importantly, um, remember to um, pursue your passion. Wow, I, I love I love what you said about pursuing your passion. Um, that is so true. And then just to just to comment on the networking, um, uh, we do have webinars, um, and one of them actually is related to how do you actually network effectively. Um, so please have a look at our website. Um, and then before I thank our panelists for sharing their time with us, I just wanted to tell um, our students that we have our careers guide that was published the first of June. Um, and it is awesome. It's packed with lots of interesting stories, um, with lots of interesting information, as well as um, an employer directory where um, they advertise internships. And you'll be surprised that sometimes it's not specific. It's kind of genetic across faculties or they recruit from the sciences. Um, so have a look. Um, you, you might you might find something there. Um, and then before we go, just to remind you, uh, Zola did share the link in the meeting chat with regards to our feedback form. So we really do value your feedback. Um, any suggestions, any ideas about other career conversations that you feel might be interesting, um, please, please share that with us. Um, we can definitely consider it. And so thank you so much for taking the afternoon, um, your lunchtime to, to kind of spend um, engaging uh, with our panelists. Um, thanks, Azola, for, for resharing that. Um, and then last, it just remains for me to say thank you so, so very much to, to all three of you. Lachey, thank you. Megan, thank you so much. And Sharif, um, thank you for availing yourselves. Um, I'm sure that our students have found it really fascinating. I have. Um, I've learned so much um, from, from what you've shared with us. So, so yeah, thank you once again. Thanks it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having us. Fantastic. Take okay. care for now. Bye. Bye. Bye.